Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Nath Arawa, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants. The premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 302 of our pharmacotherapy series which majors in acute coronary syndrome. The next question reads, JSL is a 68-year-old man who presents with a STEMI along with signs and symptoms of heart failure. His past medical history includes hypertension treated with hydrochlorothiazide 25 mg daily and diabetes for which he takes metformin 500 mg twice daily. He has smoked a pack of cigarettes per day for the past 40 years. On admission, his BP was 145 systolic 86 diastolic, and his heart rate was 90 beats per minute. His weight is 91 kilograms with a height of 5 feet 9, and a body mass index BMI of 29.5 kilograms per meter squared. Laboratory values include the following. Sodium of 139 milli equivalents per liter. Potassium of 4.2 milli equivalents per liter. Chloride of 100 milli equivalents per liter. Bicarbonate of 20 milli equivalents per liter. BUN of 15 mg per deciliter. Serum creatinine of 1.3 mg per deciliter. Glucose of 130 mg per deciliter. Hemoglobin A1c of 6.9%. Magnesium of 2 milli equivalents per liter. C. KMB fraction of 35%. The normal range is 0% to 5%. Troponin I ultra of 10 nanograms per milliliter. The normal value is less than 0.02 nanograms per milliliter. He is administered aspirin 325 mg, prosugrel 60 mg, IV nitroglycerin infusion, continuous infusion of unfractionated heparin, and intranasal oxygen. JSL is immediately sent to the catheterization laboratory in which he receives a drug eluting stent in his left anterior descending artery. After stabilization of his heart failure symptoms, JSL is started on oral metoprolol tartrate 25 mg every 6 hours. An echocardiogram is performed before discharge and shows a left ventricular ejection fraction of 35% along with the appearance of a thrombus in the left ventricle. Is an ACE inhibitor appropriate for JSL? When should an angiotensin II receptor blocker be considered? After an acute myocardial infarction, the heart undergoes processes that initially compensate for the loss of contractile function but may increase the long-term risk for development of heart failure. This is referred to as remodeling of the ventricle. The increase in the number of survivors of acute myocardial infarction has led to an increase in the number of heart failure patients. A number of clinical trials with the use of ACE inhibitors have demonstrated reductions in heart failure symptoms and mortality after myocardial infarction. 
For patients with acute coronary syndrome, oral ACE inhibitor therapy should be started within the first 24 hours of presentation for those with a left ventricular ejection fraction of 40% or less, even if asymptomatic, or clinical evidence of heart failure. Additionally, ACE inhibitors should also be considered for patients with concomitant hypertension, diabetes mellitus, and or chronic kidney disease. The use of IV ACE inhibitor therapy is not recommended. Because of its short half-life, captopril could be given on post-infarction day 2 or 3, beginning with a test dose of 6.25 mg and then titrated as tolerated. Once it is established that the patient can tolerate an ACE inhibitor, he or she can be switched to a once-daily agent such as lisinopril to simplify the regimen. The BP should be monitored closely, with systolic BP maintained greater than 90 mm of mercury. Renal function and serum potassium levels should be monitored closely during the first few months of therapy. Because JSL presents with clinical symptoms of heart failure, he is a candidate for an ACE inhibitor. Additionally, JSL has an ejection fraction of less than 40%, hypertension, and diabetes mellitus, therefore the ACE inhibitor should be continued indefinitely. If the patient cannot tolerate an ACE inhibitor because of cough, an angiotensin II receptor blocker may be an alternative. In the optimal therapy in myocardial infarction with the angiotensin II antagonist losartan, abbreviated as optimal trial and valsartan in acute myocardial infarction trial abbreviated as valiant, losartan and valsartan demonstrated similar reductions in all-cause mortality compared with captopril. Dual therapy of ACE inhibitors with angiotensin II receptor blockers offers no additional benefits but increases side effects. The next question reads, should JSL receive an aldosterone antagonist? Like angiotensin II, aldosterone plays an important role in left ventricular remodeling. Inhibiting aldosterone directly in addition to ACE inhibitor therapy was first evaluated in heart failure patients in the randomized aldactone evaluation study, abbreviated as RAILS. Another aldosterone antagonist, apilrenone, is a selective inhibitor of the mineralocorticoid receptor with fewer sexual side effects. In the apilrenone post-acute myocardial infarction heart failure efficacy and survival study, abbreviated as ephesis, patients with acute myocardial infarction and ejection fraction less than 40% receiving optimal medical therapy were randomized to apilrenone or placebo. Significant reductions in mortality, that is 15%, sudden death, that is 13%, and cardiovascular death or hospitalization, that is 21%, were seen with apilrenone compared to placebo. The ACC, AHA guidelines recommend an aldosterone antagonist in patients with NSTEACS or STEMI who are already receiving therapeutic doses of an ACE inhibitor, have an ejection fraction less than 40%, and have either symptomatic heart failure or diabetes mellitus. Potential contraindications to the use of an aldosterone antagonist in this setting include significant renal dysfunction, creatinine above 2.5 mg per deciliter in men, above 2.0 mg per deciliter in women, or creatinine clearance below 30 ml per minute, or hyperkalemia, that is potassium levels above 5 milli equivalents per liter. Because JSL has symptomatic heart failure with an ejection fraction less than 40% and diabetes mellitus, he is a candidate for an aldosterone antagonist. Serum potassium and renal function need to be checked in 2 to 3 days and 1 week after therapy initiation, then every month for the first 3 months. ACE inhibitor and potassium supplement doses may need to be adjusted. The next question reads, should JSL receive a beta blocker on discharge?
the ACC, AHA guidelines recommend continued beta blocker therapy at discharge for all patients after acute coronary syndrome. The benefits of beta blockers in reducing reinfarction and mortality outweigh the risk, even in patients with asthma, depression, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, severe peripheral vascular disease, first-degree heart block, and moderate left ventricular dysfunction. Atenolol, propanolol, carvedilol, metaprolol tartrate, and metaprolol succinate are generic, making them cost-effective. Metaprolol succinate, carvedilol, and bisoprolol are considered first-line choices in patients with heart failure, whereas atenolol, metaprolol tartrate, or metaprolol succinate should be considered in patients with stable asthma or bronchospastic pulmonary disease. Being discharged on a beta blocker is a quality performance measure. However, debate exists surrounding the duration of use, especially in low-risk patients without compelling indications. Data suggest that the benefits from beta blockers emerge early following an acute myocardial infarction and are maintained out to one year. Although the exact duration of benefit is unknown, high-risk patients e.g., GRACE score of equal to or more than 121 and diuretic use are likely to continue to derive benefit for up to three years. The 2011 AHA, ACCF Secondary Prevention Guidelines recommend a three-year treatment course for patients with normal left ventricular function, with an option to continue indefinitely as long as the medication is well tolerated. Because JSL has a low ejection fraction, he should be transitioned from oral metaprolol tartrate to metaprolol succinate, carvedilol, or bisoprolol, which should be continued indefinitely. The next question reads, should JSL be started on a lipid-lowering agent? If so, which one? When should it be initiated? A complete fasting lipid profile would be helpful and should be completed within 24 hours of presenting with an acute myocardial infarction. This is often overlooked or not done because the patient is not fasting. Most patients will require a low-cholesterol, low-saturated fat diet in addition to lipid-lowering therapy. The ACC, AHA STEMI and NSTEACS guidelines recommend that a high-intensity statin therapy be initiated or continued in all patients with acute coronary syndrome unless contraindications are present. This would consist of atorvastatin 40 to 80 mg or rosuvastatin 20 to 40 mg daily. When triglycerides are 500 mg per deciliter or more, drug therapy with niacin or a fibrate is beneficial. The myocardial ischemia reduction with aggressive cholesterol lowering abbreviated as miracle trial evaluated NSTEACS patients receiving a torvastatin 80 mg per day or placebo within 24 to 96 hours of hospitalization. A significantly lower rate of death and non-fatal major cardiac events at four months of follow-up was seen in patients receiving a torvastatin. In the pravastatin or atorvastatin evaluation and infection therapy abbreviated as PROVID TIMI 22 trial, patients with acute coronary syndrome who received atorvastatin 80 mg per day for 10 days exhibited a significantly lower risk of death, myocardial infarction, unstable angina hospitalization, stroke, and revascularization when compared with pravastatin 40 mg per day. The A to Z trial showed a favorable trend toward major cardiovascular event reduction in acute myocardial infarction patients receiving an intensive simvastatin regimen, 40 mg per day for one month followed by 80 mg per day thereafter, when initiated within 12 hours of stabilization compared to a less intensive regimen, placebo for four months followed by simvastatin 20 mg per day. However, based on clinical trials, observational studies, adverse event reports, and prescription use data, simvastatin 80 mg may be associated with increased muscle injury.
In the case of JSL, he should receive a high-intensity statin within 24 hours of his hospitalization and be discharged on a statin regardless of LDL cholesterol. This is a quality core performance measure. Drug interactions, patient tolerability, and affordability should be considered. Currently, the LDL goal for patients with acute coronary syndrome remains controversial. The ACC, AHA STEMI and NSTEACS guidelines do not recommend a specific goal LDL. However, the National Lipid Association does recommend a goal LDL less than 100 mg per deciliter in patients with acute coronary syndrome. For JSL it would be reasonable to begin a torvastatin 80 mg daily and obtain an LDL of less than 100 mg per deciliter or a reduction of 50%. The next question reads, how long should JSL continue his aspirin and prosugrel? Antiplatelet therapy with aspirin should be lifelong for JSL because of aspirin's beneficial effects on reinfarction. There appears to be no difference in efficacy for a wide range of aspirin doses, 75 to 1,500 mg per day, although higher doses may increase the incidence of side effects. The ACC, AHA guidelines recommend a dose of 81 to 325 mg daily indefinitely with a preferred maintenance dose of 81 mg daily. Dual antiplatelet therapy with clopidogrel or ticagrelor and aspirin, compared with aspirin alone, reduces major cardiovascular events in patients with established ischemic heart disease. The use of dual antiplatelet therapy with AP2Y12 inhibitor for patients who have undergone coronary stenting reduces the risk of future stent thrombosis. In acute coronary syndrome patients, ideally the P2Y12 inhibitor should be continued for at least one year regardless of the type of coronary stent. Data from the dual antiplatelet therapy, abbreviated as DAPT, trial found that dual antiplatelet therapy with clopidogrel or prosugrel continued for 30 months after placement of a drug eluting stent significantly reduced the risk of stent thrombosis and major adverse cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events compared with 12 months of therapy, but was associated with an increased risk of bleeding. Because JSL underwent percutaneous coronary intervention and received a coronary stent, his dose of aspirin will be 81 mg daily indefinitely. He should continue prosugrel 10 mg daily for at least one year. Aspirin should be prescribed at hospital discharge because it is a quality performance measure. The next question reads, if JSL had received ticagrelor instead of prosugrel, how would his ticagrelor and aspirin have been dosed? In the patients with prior heart attack using ticagrelor compared to placebo on a background of aspirin thrombolysis in myocardial infarction 54, abbreviated as Pegasus Timmy 54 study, 21,162 patients who had an acute myocardial infarction 1 to 3 years earlier were randomized to ticagrelor 90 mg twice daily, ticagrelor 60 mg twice daily, or placebo plus low-dose aspirin. Compared to placebo plus low-dose aspirin, both ticagrelor doses significantly reduced the rate of the composite of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, or stroke with a three-year rate of 7.85% in the group that received 90 mg of ticagrelor twice daily, 7.77% in the group that received 60 mg of ticagrelor twice daily, and 9.04% in the placebo group. Therefore, if JSL were to receive ticagrelor, then he would have received 180 mg load following his acute coronary syndrome event, then 90 mg twice daily during the first year, then 60 mg twice daily after the first year for up to three years. 
aspirin 325 mg would be given on day 1 of his acute coronary syndrome event followed by 81 mg daily indefinitely. The next question reads, three days before JSL's anticipated discharge, the medical team is discussing the need to administer long-term warfarin in addition to his dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and prosugrel. Is warfarin indicated for JSL at this time? Long-term warfarin may be beneficial in some patients, but clinical judgment is needed to decide whether the benefit is likely to exceed the risk. Data suggest that the incidence of a left ventricular thrombus and atrial fibrillation occurs between 7% to 46% and 2% to 22% respectively in patients following an acute myocardial infarction. The ACC AHA guidelines recommend warfarin for acute coronary syndrome patients with atrial fibrillation, mechanical heart valves, venous thromboembolism, hypercoagulable disorder, and left ventricular mural thrombus. In patients already receiving dual antiplatelet therapy, the guidelines recommend limiting the duration of triple antithrombotic therapy to minimize the risk of bleeding. Consideration can also be given to targeting a goal international normalized ratio INR of 2 to 2.5 for those patients whose usual goal INR is between 2 and 3. However, no prospective studies have demonstrated that a target INR of 2 to 2.5 reduces bleeding complications. In the what is the optimal antiplatelet and anticoagulant therapy in patients with oral anticoagulation and coronary stenting abbreviated as WOEST trial, use of clopidogrel without aspirin was associated with a significant reduction in bleeding complications and no increase in thrombotic events compared to clopidogrel with aspirin in patients undergoing percutaneous coronary intervention who were receiving oral anticoagulation. Triple antithrombotic therapy has limited information with the use of newer P2Y12 inhibitors, e.g., prosugrel, and ticagrelor. The direct thrombin inhibitors like dabigatran, or factor 10A, inhibitors, e.g., rivaroxaban, apixaban, and edoxaban. Prosugrel and ticagrelor can produce a greater degree of platelet inhibition than clopidogrel and are associated with greater rates of bleeding. Therefore, caution is required when using these agents in patients who require an anticoagulant or who are at significantly increased risk of bleeding. In the case of JSL, due to the presence of a left ventricular thrombus, he is probably a good candidate for 1 to 3 months of warfarin therapy titrated to an INR of 2 to 2.5. His dose of aspirin should be 81 mg, daily if warfarin is prescribed. It would also be reasonable to consider clopidogrel instead of prosugrel in JSL. The next question reads, should JSL receive a proton pump inhibitor? The ACC AHA, American College of Gastroenterology recommend using a proton pump inhibitor abbreviated as PPI in patients receiving dual antiplatelet therapy who have multiple risk factors for gastrointestinal bleeding such as advanced age, concomitant use of warfarin, steroids, or NSAIDs, or Helicobacter pylori infection. The ACC AHANSTEACS guidelines recommend the use of a proton pump inhibitor in patients with a history of gastrointestinal bleeding who are receiving triple antithrombotic therapy, a class 1 recommendation, and for those without a history of gastrointestinal bleeding receiving triple antithrombotic therapy, a class 2A recommendation. Because omeprazole and isomeprazole are known to inhibit the isoenzyme 2C19, the FDA recommends against the use of these with clopidogrel because of the possible reduced effectiveness of clopidogrel. If JSL receives triple antithrombotic therapy with prosugrel, any proton pump inhibitor can be used. 
The next question reads, how would you summarize the long-term therapy needed by JSL on discharge? Appropriate discharge medications for JSL include a beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, aldosterone antagonist, aspirin 81 mg per day, P2Y12 inhibitor, proton pump inhibitor, and warfarin to achieve an INR of 2 to 2.5. He also should receive a prescription for sublingual nitroglycerin to carry with him for use as needed. These agents should be continued long-term except for warfarin, which should be discontinued after a few months if his left ventricular thrombus has resolved. Continuation of the P2Y12 inhibitor beyond one year may be considered after careful assessment of the patient's ischemic and bleeding risk. JSL should be started on a statin to achieve an LDL goal of less than 100 mg per deciliter or a 50% reduction from his baseline value. Routine liver function tests should be obtained before initiation of therapy and periodically thereafter. His previous hydrochlorothiazide may be discontinued because his hypertension will likely be controlled with the beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, and aldosterone antagonist. His metformin should be continued, and his blood glucose monitored closely. As JSL will have several new medications, he will need education regarding his medications prior to discharge in order to optimize medication adherence. The next question reads, what types of lifestyle modifications should JSL be encouraged to pursue to reduce his risk factors? JSL must be encouraged to stop smoking, this may be the most important change he can make. For weight management, an initial goal weight loss should be to reduce body weight by approximately 10% from baseline if BMI exceeds 25 kg per meter squared. Other dietary modifications should be implemented so that JSL can maintain a hemoglobin A1c less than 7% and achieve a BP goal of less than 140 systolic, 90 diastolic, or possibly lower, because JSL has diabetes mellitus, and a serum LDL less than 100 mg per deciliter. In summary, although mortality and incidence rates for acute coronary syndrome appear to be on the decline, acute coronary syndrome still remains a major cause of morbidity and mortality in the United States. The use of percutaneous coronary intervention has significantly improved the survival of patients with STEMI. The major risk associated with thrombolysis is bleeding, especially intracerebral hemorrhage. Another problem associated with fibrinolytic therapy is reocclusion of the artery that was initially opened. Percutaneous coronary intervention is more effective than fibrinolytic therapy, however, it is available only in hospitals with experienced invasive cardiologists, thereby limiting its availability to some patients. Aspirin should be given to all patients with acute coronary syndrome, unless there is a contraindication. Beta blockers and statins should be administered as well. P2Y12 inhibitors are recommended with aspirin in all patients with acute coronary syndrome with or without stenting. ACE inhibitors, angiotensin II receptor blockers, and aldosterone antagonists have been shown to be beneficial in patients who have left ventricular dysfunction, that is a left ventricular ejection fraction below 40%, and are also recommended for secondary prevention. Nitrates are useful, but care must be taken to maintain an adequate perfusion pressure. Secondary prevention emphasizing a healthy lifestyle and aggressive lipid lowering are important components to the overall treatment plan. So there you have it, our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. 
Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arawa, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 303.